<laughs> that got the biggest laugh when you I stopped. I know, so we think we're going to put that on a loop. Um, welcome to Seriously Funny, and in a moment, <laughs> KG will be here, but we'll start anyway, otherwise we'll <laughs> run out of time. Um, okay, so I'm glad, oh, here he is. <laughs> you just missed the funniest part of the panel. <laughs> okay, so we're very happy you laughed at that because um, you know there's a lot of research going into the science of laughter now. Um, it's something that neuroscientists don't usually care much about. They only care about the bad things in life, but actually, laughter does affect your your brain. It um, it, it pretty much allows us to open our minds. There is a neuroscience behind it, why we laugh. And actually, why we laugh um, is why we're here today, because putting laughter and humour, putting humour into documentary, is a very good way of getting some very serious information across. Um, and I would like to introduce our panellists from the far right, although I'm not saying you're from the far right. I am, don't worry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so is Adam G from Channel 4. Um, to the left of the far right is KG. Um, are you related, you guys? Yeah, it's, um, totally related. AG, okay, yeah. okay. Totally. And, uh, and to Brothers. the left of the right and the far right, <laughs> his right, yeah, that's is, right. Uh, what's your name? Yeah. Mark Lewis. He's come all the way from Australia. Yeah. Australia. Australia. I'll put my best Australian accent on. And then, and then we have Rudolf Herzog. And then we have Hayden Prowse. So um, I'm going to start off with uh, my good friend Mark Lewis, who had a very big night and he doesn't want to go first, so I made him go first because I think that's funny. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ruth. Um, look, I just want to say something. And I'm a filmmaker. I'm not a comedian and I'm, I'm not funny. Uh, but I've got only three things to share with you and then I'm going to just play clips and uh, we can talk about them later. Um, the three things I want to share with you is that, first up, life is funny. Second thing, it's a cliche, is uh, truth is stranger than uh, fiction. And the third thing is uh, comedy is a serious business. So, um, like I said, um, I started filmmaking. My first film was 25 years ago. It was a film bought by the BBC then. Um, we're going to show a clip from that film. It was called uh, Cane Toads and a Natural History. It played BBC One and uh, still plays somewhere around the place. Um, excuse the quality of the clip. Um, it's reasonably poor, I think, for some reason. But, um, Ruth, do you want to play um, LV? I, do, I just want to say something about your Cane Toad movie and what it did in Australia. What did it do? What did it do? It had <laughs> us laughing a lot. You know, Cane Toads are a pest in Australia. And we do things like hit them with golf clubs and run them over with cars. I know it sounds terrible, but I mean, these things are just, they're crazy, they're crazy. So he made a film from the cane toad's point of view and he made us laugh about it, but he also gave us a message and it was the message that was important. So, was it me I, and yeah. the message was, I reckon the best way to kill them is to put them in the freezer. It's fun, but you may. Okay. Anyway, LV, LV and, it's LV. called LV and the Combi. Oh, LV and the Combi. Yeah. Cool. And well I, excuse the quality, but you'll get it. Now, I just want to um, assure people in the audience, uh, any people who have a concern about animal rights, as we all do, that um, what he was actually running over was um, about uh, 15 pounds of brown potatoes. <laughs> that I put on the road. <laughs> so he was <laughs> mashing potatoes. Look, um, uh, that was uh, the, the first film I did, and then I, I've always been attracted. I've always found these stories. It's the stories you see on page 53 of The Sun or whatever it is. It's the story that says, you know, a hunter shot, shot by dog or hunter shot by turkey or something like that. And that led me into the next film, and it was called uh, The Wonderful World of Dogs. If you go on, yeah. um, the, the cane toad thing in Australia is that it's an invasive species. It started with like two, and now they're everywhere. And what they, they've taken over natural habitats. So the last guy, who was a scientist, who was a crocodile, he, he actually catches crocodiles for a living, Brent. And he, a lot of people kill them because that's, there's been no way to stop them. And so what Mark did, was show the cane toad side of the story. Because, I mean, they're invasive, but they're an animal. So anyway, next yeah. one. Anyway, um, I was always attracted to these funny little 
columns in the newspaper that said man shot by Turkey or something like that. So this story, um, the next film I did, again, it was with um, Channel 4. Uh, yeah, it was with Channel 4. Um, it was called The Wonderful World of Dogs. It was, again, it was made in uh, 1990, quite a time ago. And it featured um, this sequence, and it's called Pebbles. That was Pebbles. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, I use modern CGI techniques. <laughs> Drones, all the modern technology. Uh, well, look, moving on, um, you know, again, I guess the same theme. I then made a film for the Discovery Channel of all places, and we called it Animalicious. And it was at a time when there were a lot of uh, big network shows called When Animals Attack, and When Animals Attack Too, and there were those sorts of shows where you know, Timmy would be in a tent, and then you'd see a shadow outside the tent of a bear, and then Timmy would be dragged out of the tent and, and, and consumed. So I made my own sort of version of the big network shows. It was called Animalicious. And this is a um, sort of a similar sequence in some ways to what you've just seen, but it's called Flossy, and it's from uh, the film Animalicious. Such a sad story, really. Did she forgive you, Mark? <laughs> Sorry. When she saw that. <laughs> Most of the people I work with are, are fairly happy and responsive to the, the ways they're depicted. I mean, I think, I guess when you talk about comedy and films and, uh, and, and humour, uh, my attitude is that um, yeah, I, 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 just let, I, I just represent the stories and I let the people play out the characters in the own reenactment of the stories. And, um, and uh, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, that was Flossie, and that was uh, uh, the story of Pebbles. Uh, sorry, sorry, the story of uh, Babette. Um, I was very lucky. Um, several years ago, I, I was asked to remake, um, to some degree, the, the initial film, Cane Toads. And um, not only was I asked to remake it, but this was uh, four or five years ago, but um, I remade it in 3D. So it became the, um, it was the first 3D film, uh, non-fiction film in digital that played at Sundance. Uh, we had a fantastic reception at Sundance and I'm, I'm very proud of one of the sequences there for a whole lot of reasons. So if we, we play uh, Dobby, um, and I'll explain um, the significance uh, to the sequence. So it was significant, and I'm proud to say it was the first, I don't know, some of you may be familiar with some of the old acid trip films, like uh, Easy Rider and what have you, and the trip, you know, where they did that sort of spinning psychedelia thing. So it was the first um, 3D, let me get this right, it was the first 3D acid trip by a dog in cinema history. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so there are some of my clips. Um, I find these funny stories, and I just represent them and uh, produce them and direct them in my own special way and um, people enjoy them so thank you and I've got more clips but I, let's hand what it we'll over. What we'll do is we'll move on yeah, and good. at the end I reckon we'll, we'll, just keep, we'll just clip everyone out yeah? Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean that in the nicest way. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I know you did a big journey but wasn't it worth it? Oh so much. <laughs> you came all the way from Australia, Boy, especially from here. Okay, um, next up we have Rudolph. Um, and, and Rudolph has a very, um, uh, well, Rudolph, uh, I'm, in I'm, a way I'm, you have to cross borders with humour. I mean, he's German and he has to. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, I'll just, without, without yes. further ado, I'll pass you on. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did actually orig originally think that it was a mistake that I was on this panel, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, let's talk about German humor, um, <laughs> which is not great. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did a film on humor in the Third Reich. Um, <laughs> so that was a bit tricky, as you can imagine, because A, German humor isn't that great, um, and number two, humor is very, very contextual, so a lot of this stuff is, you know, so dated um, that it's barely funny or needs a lot of explanation. So it was really tricky. I actually did a whole book on it, so 
most of these jokes in here are not funny at all, and they need explanation. And they're interesting for different reasons, but not because they're funny. So, but in a way, I thought, you know, people will feel cheated if I make a film on this, and then there's nothing funny in it. It's sort of like a bit weird, that. Um, so um, I decided to kind of reenact the jokes with actors and really get really funny actors who I thought were funny. Um, so at least you got that. So the punchlines are not great, but you've got these actors. Um, the film was very, very controversial at the time for the for German audience. So uh, it's also very, very linked to culture, humor because uh, uh, Brits or Americans will have seen The Producers or Charlie Chaplin's Great Dictator. Doing this kind of humor in Germany was totally off limits when I did it. So we didn't know if it was gonna explode or not, um, but uh, it did well. Uh, it traveled, it was shown in this country on Storyville. Um, and I'd like just to play a clip of you so you get a sense of what I did. <laughs> So it's very, very difficult um, to imagine how controversial this was. I recently did a film called The Pedophile Next Door for Channel 4 with Steve Humphreys, and it's about this was 10 times as controversial at the time. Very difficult for you to imagine that if you're not German. But um, um, yeah. Um, Can I ask you yes, um, go on. about the swastika on the arm of the gym? Yes. How, what, how did you get to do that? What, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, you're not allowed to put a swash ticker anywhere, let alone on a chip on television. Um, how did you, I mean, how did that go down? Uh, yeah, well, you're allowed, to, you're allowed to do it if it's for satire. So it's oh, really? obviously satire. Okay. You're allowed to do it, then you can do it. Uh, and the other exception, I think, is if it's in a sort of historical context. And I think we tick, tick both of those boxes. So in terms of the legal issues, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. a problem. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, but, but that joke sort of carried, but there were a lot of jokes in that film that you just could not translate. And so, actually, you know, humour, humour is one of those things where, you know, it, it suits certain, you know, demographics, certain ages, certain, but, but really, I mean, laughter, when we showed that clip on laughter, everyone starts laughing, but they don't necessarily start laughing at humour. So that's where the, there's a real fine line between how you do it. Yeah, yeah. As I said, it's very, very contextual and dependent on the culture. In this case, I mean, the, the idea was that we looked at the, um, the jokes to see what people really thought, because th this was a sort of mass phenomenon in the Third Reich, like people were telling these political jokes all the time. And it's quite interesting the way the uh, regime actually treated the people who got caught what happened, what didn't happen, um, if it was subversive or not, uh, did it actually subvert the regime in some way, or was it just a vent to let off steam and then you don't go out marching on the street after you've told the joke? So all of these things I explore in the film and in the book as well. Um, so there was a reason for it, and I think that kind of helped um, cushion it. <laughs> it wasn't just done for the, for the fun of it. Uh, maybe we should just move on so to the I next thing. Say, I think one of the Go difficult ahead. things, yeah. when you make documentary films or non-fiction films, I, th I think the presumption is it's going to be about a serious subject. And so, and so we're against the um, war with some of these when you do put humour in the film because people think that they're not allowed to laugh or they shouldn't laugh. And what we used to do when we used to have cinema screenings, I'd always put like a, a, a person who could laugh very easily, like a laugh starter in the audience, that would start laughing and then let the audience know that they could laugh oh. at, the, at the film. But documentary, it's, people just assume that it's going to be about a serious, um, fairly prosaic, uh, sorry, didactic subject. It's a, good, it's a good thing to have in your toolbox as a documentary filmmaker. I'm just going to show you another thing in a, in a second. Uh, again, this is a book I wrote, A Short History of Nuclear Folly, which is about like, crazy stories from the Cold War about you know, what people did with nuclear weapons, like uh, losing 40 of them. And I made, turned that into a, a film, and uh, initially in the cut, I didn't really capture the sort of slightly tongue-in-cheek tone of the book. It got a bit heavy, so I thought, well, at least some of it needs a bit of spicing up. And this is not laugh out funny, but I tried to make it a bit weird. So, you be the judge of it. A 
Okay, so this is kind of like a bizarre story to kick the whole thing off, um, because later on some of the stories are quite tragic. Um, there's, a, there's a mother who lost her child. Um, there's a story of which I dug up, which is um, basically the Americans, in case of a conventional uh, attack of the Red Army, would have turned everything east of the Rhine into nuclear rubble, like radioactive rubble. So they planted these nuclear mines all over West Germany to basically counter a Red Army attack. So some of this is kind of uh, extreme. And uh, just if you, if you only do those kind of things, it really becomes very, it doesn't become palatable anymore. So I think it needed that kind of weirdness of the beginning to open you up to be able to watch that. It's actually not something I've come up with. It's, uh, if, you've, if you've ever seen Milos Forman's The Cuckoo's Nest, I mean, that's like, you know, uh, at least two thirds of that, if not three quarters of that, is a comedy. I mean, it's like Nicholson doing all these, t you know, antics. And in the end, uh, it becomes a tragedy and that hits you much harder because you've, you know, started to love these characters. You've laughed not at them, but with them and then something terrible happens to him, and that just really hits home. So I think as a, as a device in the toolbox, it's very strong, and I'm kind of surprised that it's not used more often. Okay, so again, it's not laugh out loud, but um, uh, it just needed this little bit of weirdness in the beginning to, to open up the audience for the, for the actual message or the, the rest of the film. Can I, why didn't the bomb go off? Uh, the, the question was, why didn't the bomb go off? Um, the reason is that uh, uh, the, there's a trigger in it which uh, has conventional explosive which sets in motion the nuclear reaction. Um, but at that time, these were weapons which are called open pit, which means that there was, the nuclear charge was kept separately in the plane. So what fell out was the shell with the high explosive and not the nuclear. So that's only put in for certain... Uh, practice exercises and obviously in, in a wartime situation. That changed in the 50s because reaction time became so much faster. Uh, so they had to have them, the, 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 the two stages integrated. So modern nuclear weapons have both stages together, which is called a sealed pit weapon. Okay, so that's. And um, obviously, too, the use of music. Is, uh, is absolutely crucial. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. Well, thanks for bringing that up. That's yes, actually quite so. a good point. Uh, it's ballet music. I, I use ballet music. Uh, I can't tell you why exactly, but I thought it would just kind of, it sort of captured the, the kind of innocence and kind of belief in that technology, ballet, for some reason. And it's quite, you know, it, it almost seems like a ballet when they're rushing at the nuclear cloud. So I thought that was kind of, kind of interesting to juxtapose it in this way. And you, you get all of, that, all of that delight and innocence um, and warpedness of you know, what they were doing, which is basically kind of you know, sending these people into this radioactive desert. And so that's, that's what I used. I used a lot of uh, music of the time, as you saw, the, this, this Calypso thing. Um, and I had some music composed, so the music concept was kind of complex, but it needed that because there's so many different emotional, you know, triggers I had to hit. Um, so that that yeah, thanks for the question. Actually, that that does play an important part actually in Mark's clips as well. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, Rudolf. We're we're actually going to move on now because you two guys are like behind the camera, um, doing your humour, and and. Now we're going on to Adam. I'm not saying he does his humour in front of the camera, but Adam is a commissioning editor who is starting to commission humour. And Adam, can you just explain uh, where you're going with humour and how that fits to the two people, two other people here, KG and Hayden? Sure. <coughs> so um, I'm a multi-platform commissioner at Channel 4 and I also commission short-form video all in the sort of factual arena. And with the multi-platform or transmedia stuff, um, it's got this kind of natural tendency at Channel 4, because we're a public service broadcaster, to be public service-y, often quite campaign-y. Um, so when I do things like um, Fish Fight with Hugh Fernley Whittingstall or um, Don't Stop the Music with um, James Rhodes, they, um, humor's really just not a big factor. Um, and in fact, they have a tendency to earnestness. But um, 
in short form realm, it's really the core. So um, I want to just show you a, a film that I did with KG and um, Hayden's company, um, just to give you a sense of where I'm coming from on this. So this is um, Futuregasm. Futuregasm is a Futuregasm is a series um, looking at West Coast trends in the USA and whether they're likely to come this side of the water. So KG uh, took off to San Francisco and went and checked out some of the stuff that's happening, both in terms of technology and just sort of social um, trends, and uh, tried to sort of get under their skin a bit and see whether they were likely to. Um, um, get this side of the water. That's fine. I, I, can, I do my farmyard animal a joke impressions. Would be good. A joke would be good right now. Yeah. <laughs> now I was going to do my farmyard animal... Oh, too late, sorry. <laughs> no, please. No, you go ahead. Now I've got too much to get through. <laughs> So, um, you know, the guy you see at the beginning, the ch chief executive of Blipper, he's a pretty major, major league player in Silicon Valley. Um, and it's really, I like the way that both, um, you know, the comedy hooks us into the film. We, on our short films on Channel 4, the um, completion, completed viewing rate is over, on average, is over 90%. Whereas on Google, for example, it's like 25%, you know, top. So... <laughs> Um, part of it is it's very useful to sort of hook people into the film and keep them there. Um, but I think you can also see how it gets under the skin of the privacy issue um, very early on, because the theme of the, um, this film, of, of the one you've just seen, it's not about Google Glass, the device, it's about the phenomenon of people, um, the, ba the backlash against it in bars and other social places. Um, but I think I'd really like to sort of highlight, it's a great skill to be able to um, pull that off um, uh, as the on-screen talent. So um, you can see there's 12 episodes of Future Gasm, and you can see them all on um, all four, which is uh, what 4OD is now called. And um, if you watch um, KG's performance across the series, it's really interesting, cause, and you can see a lot of it here, but he puts people at their ease. Um, he gets a chance to sort of satirize Google and um, other corporations. There's a there's a series there, there's a sh um, an episode where he finds out you see it on camera that the guy he's actually dealing with has got Asperger's and he flips into a completely different sort of mode to to deal with this guy and it's really lovely to watch um, and then you see him you know he's hard on business people he's comfortable with housewives um, <laughs> sorry yeah you can say um, good with animals yes except for cane toads and. Um, <laughs> He has, um, you know, real kind of flexibility and sensitivity, which is really worth looking at. Um, How did you find him? Yeah. Or did he what's find really, you? What's really interesting um, is that, I don't even know if how, to, to what degree, well, no, you must know about this, but, but fundamentally it was a regular sort of casting um, um, session, and I saw all these different tapes, and he just stood out a mile because he had um, this humour combined with... Um, a sort of an understanding and an interest in the in the themes, but most importantly, just the kind of quick wittedness. KG does um, quite a lot of stand up comedy, and it really tells. So he's just really spontaneous and quick to spot. I think we'd better hear from him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's a bit hot. <laughs> Thank you. Very so much. I'll spare your blushes further. Um, it, so. It was actually sort of um, because of doing Future Gasm this year that I just got really interested in this um, question of, you know, what's the use of humour and what advantage does it bring you as a documentary or factual filmmaker? And that was really sort of what got me to sort of pitch this session to DocFest this particular year. And um, the, the, the things, the sort of conclusions I take away, and, and it sort of in some ways bring together some of the stuff we've already heard to, um, to date is... I think it's really, um, it can be really useful for access, um, trust, and cooperation. And I think KG will go on and show you um, particularly what I mean regarding cooperation in a second. Um, and then it really brings rewards in terms of insight and connection and empathy. And I think even from that short three-minute film, you can see how he's connecting with the variety of characters that are in there and it enables him to ask the unaskable and that's that's yeah. the real advantage um 
there's kind of warmth that, that it brings along, and it's kind of easy to uh, make films that are a little bit cynical. And, and in terms of our sort of short form output, I, I, I sort of like to think of ourselves more as kind of like nice vice, so just not that basic. So it's got the energy, but not quite the, uh, the underlying cynicism. <laughs> um, <laughs> It gives impact and cut through because it's a really noisy world, the short form video world. So you've got to be able to, to cut through and make a noise and get people in there and have a certain sort of, almost, you know, verging on tabloid sensibility just at the front ends of films to get people in and to watch. And then one thing that it's easy to overlook, um, but entertainment and being entertaining is, um, you know, is fundamental. That's kind of the business that we're in. And so the one thing, we've got a real disparate um, range of short form uh, on uh, all four and the thing that kind of unites it, the backbone, is just being entertaining. So I'm just going to take two seconds, having so many kind of filmmakers in the audience, to give you a quick mini brief on what we look for um, when commissioning series like Futuregasm or any short form. Um, very simple, it's just five things really and the key one, the, the sort of number one one is about it needs to be entertaining. Secondly, it needs to be resolutely aimed at our 16 to 24 year old audience that are consuming this stuff. Um, thirdly, it needs to have a bit of fun or joie de vivre. It's kind of easy to um, get into kind of dark and gloomy spaces, but um, you have to constantly sort of check yourself, I think. Sometimes you look at the Channel 4 schedules at night, even at their best, and it sometimes feels like a bit of a chore. And I think it was an organization we're always reminding ourselves to. Um, to, you know, to have the full range and to have stuff that's, um, that has that sort of um, joie de vivre in it. Um, fourthly, not essential but really useful, a bit of Channel 4 cheekiness, which you, you'll know and love from the, the output that you'll know from us. And then lastly, um, something that's more kind of action and actuality driven rather than just talky. So having a, an on-screen presenter like KG is a really good way of, uh, of getting that action. Thank you. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'd sort of conclude just by saying it's really easy to, to lose sight of the fact that we are in the entertainment business. Um, but being entertaining doesn't mean um, that you can't give insight and that you can't help understanding. In fact, you know, I'd argue it's quite the opposite. And uh, that, with that, AG will hand over to KG. I just want to ask you something Sorry. first. Yep. You don't get out so easy. Yep. Um, I just Damn. wanted to know, because you, you know, all of this is going online, mm -hmm. so how does it go? In, like, do you have any numbers of how these sorts of Channel 4 comedy programs, Comedy Factual, goes in the rest of the world? Like, you know, do people, are you getting clicks in the US, in Australia, France, um, you know, like how does it... Well, we've been doing short form um, content um, in a sort of, uh, in, in a sort of proper strategic, properly invested in way, only um, really since last summer. So it's quite early days and the whole infrastructure of it has been evolving. So it's gone through a process where it started off um, it, that it wasn't even open to the outside world and then it's been opened recently to the outside world and then um, it's been very much focused on our on-demand um, platform but now it, there's a sort of a more sophisticated life cycle which, where, where it sort of moves outwards in concentric circles into social media and then into a more sort of syndicated scenario. So um, the answer is increasingly um, being seen across the okay, world. Okay, next year, this time next year. No, I mean, the, yeah, and the numbers are, are good, but it's, you know, we're yeah. now sort of not fighting yeah. with our no, hands. I'm just sort of interested in how humour travels. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, <coughs> and thank you for coming up with the idea, because, I mean, it's, it's, it's no a worries. really good thing <laughs> cool. to be doing. And now, KG. Yes. <laughs> how you doing, guys? Everyone all right? You guys cool? What's up? Cool, wicked. Um, I thought I'd do what you did and start with three things, because you sounded really deep. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Sip water while I say it. You don't it. know me that well. No, it was good. It was really good. Oh, cool. It was really okay, good. I'm, I'm um, so these are my three things. Um, <laughs> life is funny. <laughs> I've heard that before somewhere. No, this is all me. This is all me. <laughs> In a Tarantino kind of way. <laughs> What's, the What's the second thing? Truth is stronger. Stranger. Yeah, oh, is that the <laughs> That's how I felt, my GCSE's cool. And um, comedy's a serious business. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say those three things and just leave a pause. <laughs> but no, all right, cool. Um, 
I just want to talk about, like, so that I'll, I'll go in, I'll, I'll move in all over the place, but then just talk about Future Gasm because you just saw it. Um, the, some, just for filmmakers and stuff, people are thinking about going and doing these, um, adding humour to documentaries. Like, there's some key techniques, I think, that will just make it brilliant. So, like, when we get on, to, when we get on the set, I would, never speak to the, um, I would never speak to the people that we're, we're going to be filming with. And then what's really interesting about that is you get, it's like you see how we're speaking right now. You're engrossed, you're learning with me. We're having a conversation and stuff. So if you don't, I, I, I tell them at the beginning, I say, you know what, I'm not going to speak to you because I kind of want to go on the journey on camera. And I think you can kind of see that. And then, um, and that's, that's really good. I think that's, that's one of the, um, that was one of the things that just, and they don't know what to expect as well. So we haven't spoken and it's like the first time we're speaking is literally on, because you'll miss stuff. You know when you have the small talk, sometimes in that small talk, there's just great little nuggets that'll be great for the, um, great for the film, the footage and stuff. Um, we'll have a breakfast off, so um, before we start filming, just to make everyone just cool and relaxed, I'll, we'll start to say, okay, um, what did you have for breakfast? But then, I want you, it needs to be ridiculous. So like, just imagine, what did you have for breakfast? Come on, let's play, let's play the breakfast game. All right, what'd you have for breakfast today? But make it ridiculous, bro, like, no, that's, throw that stuff doesn't in have there. to be ridiculous. Go on then, bruv. Blood pudding. Blood pudding. Bacon. <laughs> Bacon. Beans. Yeah, anything else? Eggs. Eggs. Sausages. Can I tell you what I had? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I had black pudding, not because I'm black, just because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's named after us as well. We don't eat it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Did you have beans? <laughs> um, no, I had a swan. I had a swan. But it's <laughs> basically, like, I think in that, just imagine the first time we start speaking and we're talking about breakfast and stuff, it kind of just chills everybody out, you know, like, and they come out of CEO mode. So that guy that I was at Blipper, he was literally standing with, um, was pretending to like, was holding our penises, you know? <laughs> and I know he would never do that. Like in any other, like, in any other place, that's not gonna happen. But then just because he just feels relaxed and calm and stuff, yeah. and it's like, this is different to what happens in a documentary. When you come to a documentary, it's like, tell me everything about your life. Nah, maybe not, maybe just, tell some jokes and stuff, and then you just get some great stuff. So one of the um, cool things we happened, we met these co-rollers, and um, it was just out of funny conversation that was happening. So he, they have these souped-up cars that basically destroy, it just um, totally is there to destroy the environment. But then the funny thing about it is when we started talking, he actually told me that he works for a recycling company. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like, and it, you, you notice it, it just, it, it, like the drop just, um, the joke just fits in the pocket so nicely and it's like, that's hilarious because the last three minutes of destroying the environment and you actually care about the environment. So it was really weird, um, funny stuff that was gonna come out. Um, yeah, so that's just about futuregasm. If I could speak about how this, I came to pass, um, I did a video on YouTube um, called, um, it's called Shadrach and the Mandem, but then it was, um, it was on Tosh.0, oh, it's called The Roller Skating Gangster. Basically, I don't know, um, have you got it? I'll send it to you if you want. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, maybe the short one because, <laughs> yeah. Just play it from, play it from near the end when oh, sure, I'm sure. less gangster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so to, you can go onto YouTube literally, and then we can I can help you. <laughs> but anyway, that video did. Sorry, that video did really well. That video actually got like over a million hits, and people reposted it and stuff. It was crazy how um, it worked and stuff. But then the main thing about that video was taking. I don't know if you guys are into like hood urban videos like crime and all this other stuff, but artists in the beginning, they'd be really angry on camera and they're like, so artists that are doing really well, they just looked really angry, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, and stuff, and it's like, but you're doing well. So we thought, why not do a, like a, um, a video that kind of embodies that, basically of the anger, but then with a twist at the end. So. Um, play the short one, please, <laughs> not the long one. I don't know which um, the short one is, but should I just play it from... 
yeah, halfway through, halfway through, because it's very gangster. <laughs> Yeah, we kid. So that, that I, was I, a, I, 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 I think you forgot to ask them what they had for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, I didn't ask them what they had for breakfast. <laughs> so the, the, the thing about that was it, like, it totally, and we were talking about artists that are in the game, like proper, um, so how it started is it sent, um, we're sending a beef, like beef records for these certain artists. They can't go to certain places, it's popping up on different websites and stuff. So people thought there was anger towards different, like, grime or rap artists and stuff, and then you see roller skates. And it kind of like, it totally flips it on its head, and it's like, and then they, they almost, a lot of them start like, got in contact with us, and I was like, it's funny because we used to act like that, and they kind of like, they didn't want to you know more, because they saw the, the silliness in terms of, why are we so angry? <laughs> you know what I mean? At that moment, like, we're, we're selling a lot of records and stuff, so. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that went really well, and then, so that done, that, that went, went all over the place, that was on Tosh.0, oh, um, on Paramount, it was on loads of different, like, comedy shows and stuff like that, and then, um, funny enough, we done another video called, we're not going to show it, don't worry, it's called Guns and Pork, um, that was, is, the one I wanted to show is it, <laughs> and they had, like, we had, um, it was so silly because we had loads of, because of what we did, we got loads of love for the music industry, so, like, gigs, all these great rappers and stuff, loads of people just jumped on it because they thought, you know what, this is cool, this is different and stuff, and then it kind of, um, we just started to progress, so from there, so it's almost living the dream because like YouTube, YouTube, then hair really, which is pretty sick. Um, <laughs> um, where, where, I want to show hoodies. Yeah, so just to bring on, just to bring on to a hoodie, um, the hoodie makeover, so I grew up in Brixton and we used to, I used to get stopped, like, there was a time I got stopped, like, three or four times in one day. You know what I'm saying? For, I'm not doing anything wrong, I was getting to college. I just wore a hoodie. So, um, we decided to make this, um, which is the hoodie makeover. You'll just get it when you start watching it. Well, yeah, and I'll talk about it after. Yeah, so, um, and that's, we done, that was the cool stuff, like, we, we done some brilliant stuff with Hayden, Jolien, like, um, Don't Panic and stuff, and it's like, what's really good about that is, I don't know if you guys ever tried to film stuff, and you, as soon as you bring a camera out, the police are just onto you. Have you got this, mate? Have you got that? Sorry, mate, you can't film. When we was doing that in, the, in those outfits... <laughs> They left us alone. <laughs> like so we, we was, should all be It was, was incredible. Things. Like I couldn't believe it. We was doing like even when I there's a part when I actually said that's never happened before. I'm actually being 100 percent genuinely honest. That has never happened. Like was helping police get out. They're smiling and waving. Um, <laughs> took a picture with a police. Like he was taking pictures of us. That could never like, um, and it literally just because of an outfit which was crazy, so it came across, and think yeah. about all the stuff that's going on could, in America. That's a really great format, though. You could actually travel the world doing that. I can see you, I'm, I mean, I know this is politically incorrect, but go to ISIS. I mean, that I reckon the be, hoods are the poor. Um, that, that, um, just for my life at the moment. <laughs> um, I don't know if this beard is gonna, <laughs> is gonna protect me. Um, <laughs> Telling us to take our hoods off. Basically, she's just told me to go to ISIS. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> nice, no, cool. We'll segue. But yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> um, I won't be getting to ISIS at the moment unless you want to make Adam, a cool next, video about future, Adam. Guys. Is that could could we do that? got to do uh, what women really want first. In ISIS, what women really want in ISIS. We could do series two with ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, cool. Um, <laughs> don't say anything inappropriate, there's cameras. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, but basically, um, what's really cool is it's just being able to, um, just coming from where I grew up and stuff, you don't have a relationship with the police. So to be able to like really do stuff like that and kind of, it's breaking down a lot of barriers. It's breaking down a lot of barriers and stuff. When I, I get it, there was times when I would like, I would drive <laughs> um, with my seat like really reclined 
<laughs> um, like, I'm like, yeah. there's like five, there's four guys in the car. We've all got hoodies on, tints, and loud music. And then I get stopped, and I'll be like, why are you stopping me? <laughs> but then I did look, you know what I mean? There was, there's almost, you know, you see two sides of the picture, almost. When I was growing up, I couldn't see the both sides of the picture. So it's almost, when you're speaking to them, you get, okay, I'm stopping you because of this. I'm just trying to do my job in this, that, and the other. Like, we, we kind of both understood each other in the pieces that we're making. So, um, yeah, that's really good. I don't know what else I was going to say, but... Um, it's really one the cool thing the coolest thing I think that's happening right now is um there's new faces on t v do you know what I mean with new stories and stuff and i think um I think it's time for stuff like that, like when I saw the revolution we televised, I was like, yes, you know what I mean that's we need to see stuff that challenges status quo and stuff, so as soon as um they um both Hayden and Jolly, they're good friends of mine, but as soon as um they saw what we was doing. They was like, yeah, man, let's get it. And I think it's smart for um, the future filmmakers or future people in TV. It's like, don't miss it. You know what I mean? Like, um, don't miss it because you think you want to play it safe and stuff. Let's make some wicked TV. Let's make some good stuff. And humor is a good way to do it. So, yeah, thank you very much for listening to me. Cool. Um, just turn that off until we're... Into it. Thanks. I'm just playing on my computer. Well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much, KG. Oh, and you. now, um, Hayden, your turn. Mm. Um, I just wanted to play before. I'm trying to actually get that bullshit clip. Okay. Why are we playing <laughs> that one? It's not because, there. You don't want that one. But there's better examples of okay. humour and, and. I was just thinking yeah. it was funny for an Australian, but maybe it's not play, funny yeah. for an. You should start talking anyway. Hey, no, we, we could start with that. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. but say something because I haven't got it sorted. Um, or you could, can I? Can I? Yeah, just yeah. Stick you just. Right. Yeah. Actually, that looks like it's. Oh yeah. That looks like a bad version as yeah, well. Yeah, it is a bad version. Someone's filmed it off. Um, yeah. Anyway, this is Hayden Brass. Hello. And um, <laughs> these guys, <laughs> these guys obviously all work together. And uh, how were you discovered? Um, well, we used to do a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, documentaries and kind of silly stunts. It started out as stunts actually after the financial crash and the MP scandal. And um, you know, we would do things like put plaques on Jackie Smith's house, um, blue plaques saying, "Jackie Smith does not live here." Uh, for, her, for the purposes of her expenses and we'd kind of ride off the back of, of news stories and um, I think the first clip, actually let's play this one, I think the first, the first thing that we did which got kind of a lot of public attention was, um, was going to an MP's house called Alan Duncan um, who had claimed I think £27,000 on gardening expenses and obviously everyone was a bit pissed off about this. Um, so we decided to go to his house and um, plant pansies <laughs> in, his, oh, yeah. in his lawn um, in the shape of a pound sign. Um, and it's kind of really low budget. We just had a small sort of A1 Sony camera and we kind of just go and do it. And I'm not going to play it from the beginning because there's like a long preamble of me explaining why we're doing this sort of um, criminal damage. And then we kind of rock up at the house. It's obviously just a very stupid way of, of kind of imparting information and we were kind of riding off the back of the public anger that, that existed over the MP's uh, expenses scandal, but also sort of, um, yeah, sort of imparting information at the same time. And we would, oh no, if you, hey, can I just play this one? Sure, yeah. sure, sure. And then we kind of um, sort of turned that made, that, made it a bit more journalistic, I guess. We didn't really have a clue what we were doing, but we just sort of <laughs> got a bunch of secret cameras and did things like this. So yeah, we would, we'd do a bunch of the, those kinds of things, I guess min mixing kind of stunts with, with journalism. Um, and um, although some of it was quite serious journalism, we do, I, I end up doing a um, series of sort of FOIs, um, ended up um, discovering that um, the British Army um, had been showcasing totally fraudulent bomb detectors um, on behalf of sort of criminal British salesmen overseas in places like Iraq. And this one chap had sold, I think, £81 million of these fraudulent detectors to the Iraqi authorities. And they were basically divining rods 
that had no technology in them whatsoever. They were just a scam. And these guys were on the sort of outside Baghdad, outside Fallujah, using them uh, to detect for, for bombs going into these cities when there's a full-scale civil war happening and, you know, th hundreds of thousands of people were dying. And this was a British company selling these fraudulent detectors to the Iraqis and just hoodwinking them. And obviously they bought them partly because the British army would go to these arms fairs and they'd sort of have their British servicemen showcasing these things and it was a sort of stamp of authority. So me and Joel, who's over there, I won't show you the clip, but we kind of did it as a... It was on Newsnight, so it was an expose on Newsnight, but the way we would do it on our YouTube channel is, you know, Jolly and would play a sort of um, a Blue Peter presenter, and he'd be like, hello, and here we are today with a totally fraudulent bomb detector, uh, which you can make with a plastic carton and a coat hanger. And we sort of do it like that, and I guess um, that was what eventually got us into um, doing the revolution we televised. And if you can play, there's... There's one Which up here, one? actually, the first one, yeah, because I think this, yeah. is, this yeah. is probably the best example of where journalism met comedy with um, the, st the stuff we did on, um, on the revolution we televised. Really horrible, serious issue, those companies. I've worked for one of those companies for about... Uh, two and a half months for the, B for the BBC for a more serious documentary and it's horrible, it's really sort of um, you know, these guys are just like vultures they prey on the poorest and most vulnerable people in society so we, you know, John and I were always into for the Revolution we televised, which is our, our BBC show we were always into kind of just having fun with these really serious issues because like Adam said you do have a responsibility and I think a lot of the time very serious factual documentaries kind of don't live up to that responsibility, which is to entertain people as well as to impart information. There are loads of great examples of that, you know, Michael Moore, people like Chris Atkins, people like Morgan Spurlock, of, you know, sort of making documentary really entertaining and sort of having fun with it. And Joel and I, you know, we used to do things when we weren't, we didn't have the BBC stuff and we were a bit freer to just, be, to just piss around a bit. We used to do things like, we used to, I used to create whole websites. I used to nick, you know, Lockheed Martin, the... Um, the, the arms company, I used to steal their website, put a hyphen in the middle, and copy the entire website, but change little words. So we are the biggest death mongers in the entire world, and we're ha <laughs> happy to sell you as many bombs as you like. And we sort of, we put this up, and then we contact government officials and be like, hey guys, do you want some money uh, if we can maybe push some legislation on you? And these people wouldn't even read the web website, these MPs, the MPs wouldn't even read the website. And they'd be like, yeah, let's meet. you would be like, you idiots, just read the website. The whole thing is satire. And we go and meet these... Um, these charities that were kind of had, you know, sponsors like Northrop Grumman and BP is one charity called Conservation International, which had some of the worst polluting um, FTSE 100 companies in the world. And it was just after the BP spill and they hadn't said anything about it. And you looked on their website and BP was one of their major sponsors. So we were thinking how much they influenced by their, their corporate sponsors. So Jolly and I went along as these um, arms dealers with Jolly and acting as, as an arms dealer, being like, blah, blah, blah. I was like, Joel, just tone it down a little bit. But it didn't seem to matter because the, you just sit with <laughs> yeah, these yeah. people and they just bought everything. We sent them an email saying, look, we've had a couple of our missiles kill some, you know, you know, innocents in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there was a, you know, there was that leak, that WikiLeaks thing where the Hellfire missile blew up loads of kids and stuff. It was awful. And we're like, that's really bad for us PR-wise. So if you can find us a nice cuddly creature, maybe in the Middle Eastern region that we can sponsor and use that as a good PR campaign for us to kind of deflect a bit of the attention away from the whole missile with the kids thing, that'd be great. And they were like, okay, let's do some research. And they came back to us, guys, we've got a couple of amazing animals for you in the Middle East. <laughs> One's a vulture. We were like, but we don't think that really fits your brand. We're like, absolutely not. And the other one is a bird of prey. And we're like, that's perfect. So we were like, they, they agreed to let's sponsor this bird of prey through them, through the charity. Because, and they knew it was an attempt to kind of divert attention away from this awful missile thing. But we were just kind of pissing around with it, really. But it was kind of important in a way because it came out and they had to make a statement. And eventually they, yeah. What about the legalities for people like Channel 4 and the people who, how do you sort of cover all of all of that insurance-wise and well, we can't you know, do your that jail stuff. problems. Or, you know. We can't do that stuff anymore. You can't go and um, dig up MPs' gardens for the BBC or Channel 4. It I sucks. thought that anybody who actually wore a fluoro shirt yeah. could do anything. That is true, yeah. <laughs> there is an element of that. 
But it kind of it forces you to actually be a bit smarter about, look, the, the law is just how you interpret it, right? And if you work for a company like Hattrick, which makes our show for, for the BBC, you have some pretty well-paid lawyers. And they look at the facts, and they look at the information, and they tell you what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And it actually, it's in, in some ways, it forces you to be a bit more creative. You're not like, oh, just go and dig up his garden. You actually have to think of a funny joke, um, which, which forces you to think harder. And, um, but yeah, you can't, you can't obviously do those things for good reason for the BBC and Channel 4, because you would get sued. That's right. Now, I don't, I, um, well, we could play more. We don't have to. Well, wait a minute. Um, we've got um, five minutes left. Does anybody want to ask questions? Could do. Can we watch pictures? Do you want qu questions? Five minutes of questions? Anybody? What? We've stunned oh. you into silence. <laughs> more clips. <laughs> what about a bit of Norman Gunston? Sorry, <laughs> nobody knows him. <laughs> Oh, no. Okay, There's clips. A question a question. Oh, a question. Just a quick question about, did you ever, sorry. Either, just a quick question, Hayden. Did you ever get any legal trouble with the, the police for things like locking the doors of Nobu and things like that? No, no, no. Did we, um, did we ever get, no, no. We, actually, no, never. In fact, the only time was Alan Duncan, after, we, after I dug up his garden, yeah. said, I'm going to sue you. And then that was such bad PR for him because he was already seen as this greedy MP, he'd stolen all this yeah. money. He was like, actually, I'm not going to sue you. I'm going to invite you for a drink in the House of Commons instead. Right. But that resulted in him being secretly filmed by us. <laughs> <laughs> which, which resulted in him being yeah. fired because he said a bunch of stuff. Which, um, in a way, it's weird. It's because, you know, there is... It's, um, that guy is, has a lot of, you know, as Shadow Energy Minister, he was being funded by a lot of oil companies. He does a lot of business in places like Qatar, where, you know, he's, he's a gay guy, and he does a lot of business in places with a lot of people and a lot of regimes that bang you up for being gay. And I just find him completely hypocritical and basically a money man in politics. And, you know, we were, we were renegade at the time. We did a lot of stuff that wasn't particularly, yeah, whatever. But, you know, it, it served its purpose. And I think you, um, yeah, I don't know why I'm going with this. <laughs> one, um, oh, one more question there, and then we'll just, I wouldn't mind if we just played the rap clip to, to go out with, so that we do a bit of a full circle All right. internationally. Mm. And we'll just take Quick this question. question. So when you were filming at the, uh, in the Wonga shops, or, or the payday loan shops, <laughs> how did you manage to get in there without them trying, you know, th threatening to throw you out? I mean, you know, locking down locations is always a pretty difficult well, you just, they just don't see your filming because you shoot on action cams, for instance, and there are these cool apps that you know transmit what you're shooting on the action cam oh. to your to your phone. So, our, you know, a lot of our producers and stuff are kind of really good at that. And well, they have, they'll have like a a GoPro in a coffee cup, so you're holding the coffee cup like this, <laughs> and it's po pointing that. When you have sort of three or four people around the Wonga shop, and Joel's in there, and they're all kind of filming him, and um, okay. yeah, that's how we got most of our stuff. Spy. Yeah. Okay. Fabulous. We're just going to... Um, just before I sort of close... Oh, did you want to say something, KG? What video are you showing me? Um, I was going to show Rat. This is a, a clip, another clip from, um, from Mark Lewis. Do you mind? Or would no, you... Mind. You don't mind the Rat? That's good. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say, because I didn't open the panel properly, Documentary Campus um, produced and it sponsored this particular panel. We work a lot with Sheffield. Um, and we try to bring an international flavour to Sheffield. And uh, in this one, we, we very much worked um, with Adam, not you. Put your head back. You are the thank G. You. Thank you. <laughs> Cage. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you. And um, let us just uh, watch. What, I have no idea what will happen when I, we watch this. <laughs> Listen, thanks very much guys it, it's a, it was a fabulous panel thank you so much and um, yeah that's it thank you thank you